Right. Good to have you guys on our weekly call. Thank you so much for joining us again. We are excited to have you. We're going to be talking today about fats and fasting. So kind of, they, they seem almost like an oxymoron, but you'll see how they work together. It'll be really fun. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, cool. Great. Um, fantastic. Okay, cool. All right. So again, we're glad to have you guys all here again uh, this week. Um, we are going to be talking about some confusing uh, aspects of uh, fats and Crystal's actually going to start us out talking about that today. Yeah, so these are oftentimes the questions that people have and then maybe we ourselves, each of us here on the call might have had at some point or still have and we'll try to help bring some clarity as we go along. So what are fats to, per, you know, kick us off there and then which foods do I eat and then avoid because there are, you know, the healthy fats and then the unhealthy ones. And then what supplements can I use to help me keep, keep the healthy fats and release the unhealthy fats? Uh, that one might be kind of a, an unexpected question, um, but as we go through, it might make more sense. Like, oh yeah, I definitely wanna be able to keep the healthy ones there. Because most of the time it's like, just get the fat off. That's the, the idea, but not true. All right, and then the last question here is when to eat to manage fat. So that's more of the intermittent fasting that Joel was talking about. So we'll go ahead and dive on in here. Can I stop us for before sure. we dive fully? Yeah. Let's follow up, sorry, with our goal from last week. Oh, yes, for sure. How did it go for sugar, everyone? Mm. Do we want to talk was, about that? And our, I think our team goal was like adding an extra fruit. One piece of fruit a day. A day. Yep. How did uh, the extra piece of fruit or handful of berries? We said, if you added one blueberry, that doesn't count. It has to at least be three. <laughs> but how, yeah, how did adding an extra fruit a day go? Did there, anyone, yeah, uh -huh. go well nice. for it? No. No? <laughs> That's okay. yeah. <laughs> that's well, right. and I know you guys do like keto sometimes, and so that's that's fine if you have your own method that you're focusing on. So. I ate some fruit leather. Does that count? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a pretty pretty high concentration of sugar, but but we're glad you ate it. Good <laughs> way to adapt your your uh, good honesty. Yeah, here. that was good. I'm good grateful. Group we, bonding we, here. <laughs> Um, awesome guys. Yeah. Well, um, we, uh, I don't know if any of you guys had a chance to do the, uh, ice cream, um, oh, yeah. the banana. that we send out the banana ice cream. Mm -hmm. If you haven't had a chance yet, it is awesome. Get yourself some, um, good cacao, um, high quality cacao. And it's just a banana with some cacao and nuts. And it's, it's really awesome. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that video yet for our, uh, our recipe, uh, make sure that you get a chance to do that. It is very tasty. So, okay, cool. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut her off, but no, I was good. like, I wanted to make sure we talked about yeah, that. So. Yeah. Okay. And then, so our beliefs about fat, like any beliefs that you guys have when you hear the word like fat, it, like, especially when it comes in the context of like food, what, what are some thoughts that initially come to mind? I'll start. <laughs> uh, I think fats taste delicious. Uh -huh. I, I really do. I think they're they're so good, and there's nothing there's nothing inherently wrong about fats. And I think that that's a a, a belief that we have to get out of. Oh, if it tastes delicious, it must not be good for me. That is sometimes true, <laughs> but with fats, it actually can be the the opposite. Hel uh, healthy fats can be very very delicious. And you don't have to follow this list, but that's just one that. I look, I made this slide, so of course I'm gonna put that one first, right? <laughs> I think the one that I would have tended to when I before I was learning more about fats is that last statement that eating fat makes us fat. That's that's definitely the the main um, myth that we've been taught. Yeah. So does anyone else have any uh, any any beliefs about fat or or thoughts about fats that they've um, had in the past or that they currently have. We'd love to get your feedback. And if you don't, 
that's totally fine. Yeah, too. if these ones resonate to you, like so dangerous, embarrassing, inevitable with age. Yeah, and especially that last one, that eating fat makes us fat. Like that, that's definitely the culture we've been brought up in. So. Well, and I think also if you think about the dangerous, a lot of people you'll you'll hear people say, "Oh, I'm really trying to limit my cholesterol. I don't eat." you know, egg yolk anymore because it's, it's dangerous. It's going to give you a heart attack. Um, again, that's not actually true. Uh, fats are super healthy for us. That's why I wanted, we wanted to, to air these out and make sure that, Hey, if you think that these are true, um, that it's not always the case that these are true. They are delicious, dangerous. They, it, the wrong, the wrong type can be dangerous, but not their, their cholesterol is not dangerous. Um, embarrassing, you know, oh, I, I'm carrying some fat, you know, we can work on that. That's not a, a bad thing. Inevitable with age, like, oh, everyone's going to end up uh, overweight. No, that's not the, the reality either. And it's not what we have to stick to. And we have tools to actually help us be able to, to overcome. This. So hopefully tonight, we can talk about some of those ways that we can um, break some of these thought processes. So we're going to start out talking a little bit about um, some fats that we do need to avoid. Okay. So fats that you do not want to have in your um, pantry um, or using would be vegetable oils. Um, oftentimes those are going to be a, a soy oil. Um, they don't say that specifically on the, on the, oil, which is kind of funny, just says vegetable oil, usually it's a soy oil, um, canola oils, uh, peanut oils. Um, now, why are these oils not great for us? Well, uh, they're very unstable. You'd actually rather have a stable than an unstable fat. Uh, an unstable fat, when it gets heated up, it creates oxidants, or, or excuse me, it, it creates free radicals. It oxidizes, and as a result, when you eat it, it's looking for, it's stealing electrons from your body. So it's, it's stealing things that are in a state of homeostasis to make itself more uh, stable. Um, a lot of times these types of oils are gonna be found in fried foods. So uh, careful when we're eating out. Um, I will tell you, I eat French fries probably once every couple months and I enjoy them, but I don't eat them all the time, right? So we got to be careful with, um, with fried foods when we're eating out because oftentimes they're using one of these. In fact, it's usually vegetable oil that they're using. And the higher that it, the, the higher that it gets, that the heat gets, um, the, the less stable that oil is going to become. So the more um, it's going to cause issues within your body, okay? These are oils that you'll definitely want to incorporate. And Austin loves these uh, <laughs> because again, you can see it spells bacon. Um, <laughs> but the type of oils that we want to have are the butters, avocados and avocado oil, your coconut oil, your olive oils, or olives, or like, olives, right? Olives on their own. Your nuts and seeds. So, um, uh, I wanted to, to share a little bit about, um, about your, um, uh, the extra virgin olive oil, you'll want to use extra virgin olive oil because um, if, you, if you don't use extra virgin, what you end up doing, oh, you know what, I'm realizing. I was like, I think I skipped a bunch of slides here. I did, guys. I have to go back here. I'm so sorry. Because I was like, this got compacted and I was like, I'm missing slides because I have not talked about some things yet. All right. Let me it's talk always about good to talk about bacon. I'll, I'll talk. I, I really Start wanted to get to bacon. The first part of my worksheet, I was like, wait a minute, what did I miss? <laughs> no, no, I know. I'm so sorry. I was like, oh, geez, this thing got compacted. So I accidentally clicked that. Um, guys, let me come back to that because I, I do want to come and tell you about the Build. why fats are essential. Why yeah. Bacon. I'm like, why did I <laughs> hop right in there? Okay. So let's talk about the, why fats are essential. So a lot of people don't know this, but every single cell in your body is covered by what's called a phospholipid bilayer. It's a fatty layer. Um, Omega-3 oils are part of that phospholipid bilayer, but every cell has a fatty layer that surrounds it and protects the cell. 
and allows things to travel in and outside of the cell. If you do not have fats, you will not be able to supply the cells with what they need to be able to protect themselves. So fats are super, super important that way. A lot of people don't know this, but fats provide 70 to 90% of the energy for the heart, okay? Most people just think about, okay, energy is energy. Well, we actually get energy from different sources. Your, your muscles prefer uh, glucose, right? Prefer sugar energy, or they will, I should say, they use it first. They will use that first. Your heart actually does not. It actually uses fats as its main source of energy. So 70 to 90% of its energy is coming from fats. If you're not supplying your heart with fats, uh, then you will not be able to have a healthy circulatory system, right? And I'm gonna come back to that point in just a little bit. I'm gonna go through some of these and then we'll go, go in further into that point. Your brain is made up of 60% fats, all right? So if you want your uh, mental clarity, we need to be eating healthy fats. Every single hormone that you make in your body has a cholesterol base. It's all made of fat. So again, when these, these ideas that, hey, you shouldn't eat cholesterol because it's, it's going to be dangerous for you, that's actually not true. You do need cholesterol in your diet. Um, you do need to exercise and, and be careful with the types of uh, fats that you eat, but you do need cholesterol in your diet in order to make all of your hormones. Another thing about fats is that they actually cover all of our, um, all of our nerves. So whenever you're trying to send a signal from the brain to any part of the body, you've got your nerve and then around it, you have what's called an, a myelin sheath. So it's the outside part that covers it. So it would be like if you were looking at a cord um, that you have plugged in, plugged into the wall, the myelin would be the outside, the plastic part. And the nerve would be the inside part where the, um, the, wire. the wire is, right? So what happens is if you do not have fats to cover your nerve, your conduction of the nerve slows or can stop completely. So when people have nerve issues, uh, especially people with something like peripheral neuropathy or other de demyelinating diseases, they actually stop having um, function of their nerves because they don't have fat around their nerves. And in, gonna... in addition, like, so that's more for pain and more for like our, our body, but in our mind, in our brain and the nerve function there, if we don't have that, that proper um, fat uh, utilization happening, then again, just like think of a wire that's kind of fritzy and it doesn't have that white, I always call it the gripper, <laughs> the gripper outer part of the cord covering it. Now it's gonna just kind of fritz on and off and that shows up for us more emotionally and cognitively where we can't focus as well or we might feel ups and downs emotionally. Uh, so that's why we might see some changes when we're adding some healthy fats to our diet, even emotionally and cognitively. I want to thank you. I wanted, I wanted to come back really quickly to this point about your heart. Um, so there's been so much concern about um, making sure that our arteries stay clear. That is very important, right? Uh, and because especially when the uh, arteries get clogged in the heart, then you end up having uh, cardiovascular issues, heart attacks, cardiovascular uh, events. Um, the, the thing about this is if we are supplying our body, if, if it's supposed to be supplied with fats to be able to help the heart, we also have to be able to break down those fats, right? And the way that fats are broken down is through oxygen. So when we are properly exercising and using fats that are going to actually help us, the body can break down those fats and then use them in the heart. When it doesn't happen, uh, when, when that process doesn't happen, when the fats don't get broken down, um, then what happens is the heart still needs the fat. And so our liver says, I'll send you more fat. 
And unfortunately, what happens is it does never get broken down. And that's when we get clogged arteries. That's when that clogging happens. It's a positive feedback loop that the heart says, I still need energy. And the liver says, I'm still supplying you energy, but the heart just can't break it down um, because we're not working out. We're not keeping our heart actually healthy. Okay. So there's a plug for exercise. That's, we're going to talk more about that in a, in a future lesson. Um, but fats are so essential to, these are just a couple of the reasons why fats are so essential, but you can see why they're so important in, in uh, our habits and our lives. Um, this is one that, you know, Crystal mentioned, eating fat does not make you fat, but there's a caveat, unless your body can't metabolize the fats, which is what we just talked about with the heart, right? Um, this can be caused by our lack of exercise that lowers our oxygen levels, which are needed to break down our fats. Um, also, if we are um, not able to metabolize, it is usually because uh, a fat is a less stable fat, and because it's a less stable fat, it causes an inflammatory response within our bodies. When that inflammatory response happens, the body has to, has to shift. It has to divert its resources towards putting out fire rather than building the body back up. So I like to think about this. Uh, this is a very simple way of thinking about it. But do you, you guys remember when there were those fires in California a couple of years ago? Uh, like paradise was just like, Burned, burnt down to the ground. So pretend for a second you're the mayor of paradise and your city's on fire. Uh, are you going to be worried about building new parks in the middle of a forest fire? There's no way, right? There's no way you're going to be thinking about, oh, I really hope our test scores at our school is, are, are, they're, they're doing great. There's no way you're focusing on that because all you're worried about is putting out the fire. So if we're eating fats that are causing inflammatory responses, all the body can do is look at putting out the fire and not rebuilding itself and making it be more efficient and better. Does that make sense? Yeah, any questions or clarification on these two slides in particular? They're a little bit more biologically focused. Go for it. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. So if you have inflammation from other causes, same idea. So you can balance that by trying to eat healthy fats, but exercise helps like, cause that's what, I, that's what I deal with right now. That's what I'm dealing with right now. If you have inflammation, not that it's not only caused by eating other fats, but if you have inflammation no. from other causes, yep. focus on these other. Absolutely. Yeah. You want to, you want to try and, and mitigate and, and take down the inflammation as much as you can. If you're having already having an inflammatory process from other things, absolutely. You'll want to make sure, yeah, sugars are low, healthy fats are up, exercise is happening. Um, and sleep. Sleep supplements. I mean, those, those are things that are going to help take down that inflammatory process. Um, and this is just one piece of the puzzle. And that's why this isn't just a one one week course because it's it's you know it, uh, we're looking at it from a whole uh, perspective a holistic perspective but yes that's a great question Amy. yeah so you want to try and reduce the inflammation um where you know in the other parts of your life so that the inflammatory process that you're dealing with um doesn't create a snowball effect that answer your question Awesome. Any other questions you guys have? You could add in the chat at any point or raise your hand. You know, we're we're here to definitely discuss and work together along the way. I just had a quick question. Yeah. Um, about I go I was recently diagnosed um it was a couple months ago with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so I know you mentioned briefly about the liver. And so I'm really diving into everything and trying to learn as much as I can about the liver and what it does so that I can, you know, um, heal it and cure it. And obviously the biggest proponent of how to cure myself is to avoid certain fats. And so, yeah, this is a topic that interests me. Uh, and so what would you recommend right away for somebody like that? Cause like, obviously I know 
with the title of non-alcoholic, you know, it's like, there, it's not due to alcohol, it's due to, it's due to the fatty, um, and the diet. And so I just wanted your input on that. Like if somebody approaches you and it's like, Hey, I've got this, you know, what would you recommend? Um, you know, cause there's a lot of buzzwords out there like liver detox and liver this and, and like liver is obviously important, but I don't know. My question is kind of everywhere, but maybe you can help rein it in. <laughs> question. Yeah. So what I would recommend is that, uh, we're, we'll talk, like we talked about some unhealthy fats. We're going to go back to healthy fats. Mm -hmm. Definitely cutting out the unhealthy fats, using the healthy fats, exercising. There are things that you can use, um, supplements that I would recommend to be able to help t um, cleanse the liver. And when, they, when you know, people talk about a detox or, or cleanse, that is a really good thing to actually do. Um, so that would be something that you, you would definitely want to integrate also. Um, the other yeah. things, and you know, uh, Claudia, you have a, like a very specific question. Um, do you have uh, something else you wanted to answer? Yeah. So sometimes when there are specific organ dysfunctions showing up, we find that, um, using supplements that are tailored to help that organ specifically repair and rebuild um, can be very beneficial. So actually using like organ meats um, that like, so for example, liver would be really great. Um, I don't know, some cultures and some, you know, like they do really well with eating liver. Like I just haven't grown up eating liver, <laughs> but um, it's, I've heard it can be really good. Uh, but that's a great thing, but even taking it in terms of a supplement version, and we can, we can talk about that, like more specifically tailoring it for you. Um, but these are just really good general options for, for anyone to be able to take some steps forward in helping their liver to recover and metabolize better. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And, and Claudia, we'll touch bases with you and we can, we can give you some more specific. Yeah. Would that be okay? Oh yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I, for sure, I will take, this is new to me. So it's just so counterintuitive to like, oh, I've got fatty liver disease, but here I've got to eat more. I've got to eat fat. You know, like, it's just, I don't know. It's just this, like your brain is like, well, not wanting to do that. Yep. And so this is a good course that I, you know, um, can dive into with you guys right now about the differences in, in fat. And just that word is so loaded, you know, the, yeah. that word. Yep. Yeah. And that's why we want to talk, we talk about the, the emo beliefs. starting at the, the beginning with like, yeah, what beliefs do we have first? Because it is, it is very loaded. Yeah. So we want, to, we want to make sure that you know that there are, there are good healthy fats that we want to use and there are ones that we can't avoid too. Right. Mm -hmm. So we already, we already want this, uh, you know, second times, uh, around, hopefully you don't, don't miss anything here, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. we jumped jumped uh, too far ahead there. Um, we did talk about bacon. So these are ones that you would definitely want to use. Side note though, we don't necessarily want to be eating bacon all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Austin was going to ask about bacon. Yes, Austin. <laughs> yes, <sorry. laughs> sorry. Um, I have a question. So what about peanut butter? Like I know the yes. peanut oil was on the bag the bad list but it's a nut yeah so, so where I where's the much sugar what's yeah. that lots of sugar mine does not have sugar in it i don't buy the all candy. natural <laughs> organic that's fine as long as you don't have any nut allergies that's totally fine yeah if like tr uh, problems that we see with um with nut butters um peanut butter is they will oftentimes add sugar and they will sometimes add trans fats, small, small amounts of trans fats, which have been actually outlawed in 2018. All trans fats were supposed to be removed from foods, but they made this loophole. Uh, of course they did, the FDA. They said, well, if it's only uh, half a gram per, or, or uh, yeah, it was half a gram per uh, a serving size. So what they'll do is they'll make the serving size really small oh, man. <laughs> and they can still put trans fats in it, <laughs> which is really stupid. So anyway, peanut butter, yes, that nuts, seeds, and crystals, like you should put nut butters. I didn't put nut butter. Sorry about that. Yes. So we were, yeah, I knew you, you. <laughs> you she, she's got you, Austin. 
so yes, nut butters are awesome. Uh, we eat nut butters daily. So totally great question. Yeah. Um, so we went through these. I wanted to talk, go back, circle around on extra virgin olive oil. Uh, please don't get just olive oil and please don't just get virgin olive oil. It matters that you get extra virgin. And the reason why is um, extra virgin, it, it's, they take the olive and they squish it. And that means it's extra virgin. They take the oil that comes out from the first squish. With uh, virgin olive oil, they take the squished ones and they squish them again and they heat them up. Yeah. So it denatures the oil, right? And then <laughs> the last one, when you just get olive oil, they pump hexane through the olives, which is a, a chemical. Uh, and it then gets the oil, the last bit of oil to come out. So uh, I, I, I implore you, please do, do not get just olive oil. Don't get uh, uh, virgin olive oil, get extra virgin, please, because it's the first squeeze and it makes sure that you're not getting any of the crap uh, or it, it's, it's actually making sure that the oil is intact and that it, it is not uh, used, uh, extracted through a chemical process. So just a little hint. I didn't know what it was for a long time and I wanted to make sure that, yeah, we uh, went over that. Um, also, don't be afraid of meats, please. Uh, Grass-fed beef, um, organic chicken, these are great sources of meats that you can uh, integrate into your diet. Um, we're we're going to talk about protein actually next week. Um, and so don't don't be afraid of that, but also know that, hey, we, we don't eat nearly as much meat as uh, other people. Marcy, are you drawing on my screen? <laughs> All right, we're trying to unmute. I was just going to oh. say, probably, we got to make sure it doesn't go rancid too, that there is an expiration date. Okay. And yep. a lot of people in America in particular let their olive oil go rancid. Yeah. Yep. That is true. <laughs> yeah. Give it a whiff, please. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, don't be afraid of, of, of meats. We're not going to focus a, a ton on eating a lot of meats. We'll again, we'll talk about that next, next uh, lesson. Um, Omega-3 oils. I would recommend you get this in a supplement form. Um, it, it, you can get really, really great amounts of omega-3 oils. Omega-3 oils are making up your phospholipid bilayer. It's a major part and also fueling your brain. So the fats in your brain. So please incorporate that. Um, you can get them in foods, but you can get them more um, directly in like a fish oil uh, would be a, like a cod oil or something like that. So. Um, Crystal is actually going to talk a little bit uh, more about that. Yeah. So, okay. This is where the question shows up. How do I keep the healthy fats and then release the unhealthy ones? So one is, of course, as we were talking about eating, swapping out our healthy fats and also the exercise that will help both in releasing the unhealthy and keeping the healthy. Um, but one of the other ways is, of course, through supplementation. Um, so ones that we typically use, uh, we've used a variety of different fish oils over the years, um, some cod liver oils, some tuna, like, you know, even just from the algae. And um, we actually found a couple of years ago, we were, I think maybe it was after COVID had happened. So maybe we were super stressed or something and our hair was falling out, both of us. <laughs> Like, what? What's going on? <laughs> and so I knew we're um, looking at you, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, okay, well, I, I knew that hormone health, you know, we have to have the, the healthy fats to be able to help our hormones, and hormones can really affect hair. And we thought, okay, well, we got to switch this out. So we actually started using the, um, the Z Omega from doTERRA. And that within two weeks, our hair stopped falling out. Yeah. And some of the significance there is it is coming from um, high grade quality fish that are, you know, wild, but also it's the, um, the essential oils that are in it. They also have the algae in it as well. Um, so that was something that we really benefited from. Um, 
So what, again, when we're talking about hormones, I always start with a healthy base of some sort of um, omega fat. Some people do do better with um, more of a vegan, either if they are vegan themselves or actually in, um, when there are liver types of diseases, sometimes I do find that like when I'm muscle testing and just double checking to see how a person's doing, they do favor the vegan types of um, omega oils. So that's coming from like black seed and um, pomegranate seed, these sorts of things. So Tara does have that, but also um, there are some good options as well. So that's more on the omega oil side. And again, that will not just help with the hair types of things that we were talking about, but cognitively, and again, helping to hold the, the healthy fats. Um, and the significance there, especially hormonally, is that our body tends to see, okay, I am having this loss of, like, so we are oftentimes in more of a fight or flight state. So we're in more of a sympathetic mode. It's, so that means our adrenals are really going hard. And when that happens, we're making more like adrenaline and cortisol. So all of our hormone um, precursors, those cholesterol levels are going now towards our fight or flight. But we also have reproductive hormones. We've got testosterone, we've got estrogen, we've got progesterone. And so what happens is our body's like, okay, we need extra reserves of healthy, well, we not just necessarily healthy fats, but we need extra reserves of fat to be able to make our hormones, our reproductive hormones now. And so it will hold it along our hips or along our abdomen because that's where, you know, our ovaries are, testes are closer in that region as well as um, our uterus. So it goes directly in those areas that are needing more of those fats. So if we're getting more fats in our diet, then our body doesn't feel like it has to hold on to that unhealthy fat as long. It can be able to release it. So that's more on the, the omega oils. Then in terms of being able to further help with the releasing process of the unhealthy fats and even uh, detox side, that is, um, we have found MetaPower as a really great support. So it has different essential oils in it. So this one in particular it just is the essential oil. Um, but they do have a system that has like the um, fiber and then the collagen and other components. Um, but with the, in the oil itself, it has things like cinnamon and grapefruit, lemon, um, ginger. So things that are going to help digestively, but the grapefruit in particular, along with this combination, it's helping what's called the adipocytes. It's basically the, the technical term for the fat cells to go from a larger size to just gradually releasing and shrinking in size. It's not like you're getting rid of those cells, but you're actually able to see significant changes in the, the cell size shrinking. So um, if you guys have questions on that, let us know. Um, actually, our friend Malu just taught a class on MetaPower earlier uh, this evening. So if you guys wanna learn more, let us know. Um, but that's really a wonderful way of being able to help release the unhealthy. Another way is through what Joel is going to go over here with intermittent fasting. But yep. beforehand, any questions on any of those, like with the hormones and um, the omega oils or anything like that? Well, what you were listing the vegan sources of fat, what were those again? Flax, pomegranate. Yes. Um, pomegranate seeds. Yeah. Chia, pea, like pea powder, pea protein. Uh, they also have healthy fats in it as well. Um, algae. Yes. The green algae in particular, um, flax. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I know doTERRA has one, it's called V instead of X it's V omega. Um, and they have kind of a combination with more of the, Vegan. Yeah, it's all plant-based. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But algae is probably going to be the best, the, the highest source. If you're, if you want to just do food-based, then yeah, yeah then you'll you'll want to do high in algae because that's actually where the fish get their omega oils from the the reason why fish are so high in in omega oils is because they eat algae that would be and we should probably even adjust our our bacon acronym to be bacons to, <laughs> <laughs> to have seaweed yeah. in there <laughs> so 
So eat your heart out with uh, all the um, seaweed and sushi you can eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it says fish and seaweed. <laughs> Great question. Does that answer your question, Amy? Awesome. Good. Cool. All right. So let's talk about the benefits of fasting with fats. Um, and then we'll go into intermittent fasting and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we can do that. So the benefit of using fats while we fast um, is that first, it's going to help you have sustained energy. So when you eat fats, they break down more slowly. We talked a little, we touched on this again last week. So some of this is review, but when you eat a fat, it has a much longer time to break down than a simple carbohydrate does, right? So as a result, um, you will have a slower release of energy, which means you will have a more sustained level of energy rather than coming up and down and up and down, right? Which is awesome. Um, so also, if you eat a fat, you'll feel fuller longer because it takes longer for it to break down. That's <laughs> quite simply, it takes longer to break down, thus you'll feel longer fuller because it, it will go through the digestive system a little bit slower. Um, and then this is something that we talked about last week. You're not going to spike your blood sugar. Amy did mention like uh, correctly that you, you will get a little bit of a, a boost in your sugar levels when you eat meat. That's true. Um, or when you eat something protein filled, that's true. It'll just be a slower uh, release and it'll be a, uh, not as high peak. So you'll actually keep yourself in more of a ketosis state. Um, uh, and if you're not familiar with ketosis, that's okay. It doesn't, you're not required to know what that is for this <laughs> lesson, but um, let's talk about what intermittent fasting is. So quite simply, it's, you are just managing when you are eating and you're managing this so that you can maximize the amount of sugar that you can clear from your blood. Okay. So you're, you're going to do that through our insulin levels, which we've talked about before, and we're actually gonna talk about again today. We maximize the use of our insulin when we do fasting because we save our insulin. We don't use it because we aren't eating. Once we've cleared the, the sugar out of the blood, then we don't need to use insulin anymore. And so our body can preserve it for the next meal. And then it can release it again, and we can uh, use sugar to get, uh, or excuse me, excuse me, insulin out of the blood uh, to get sugar out of the blood and back into the cells where we want it. Um, this, the benefit of doing this means that our cells do not become resistant to insulin. Many times, what happens is our cells just say, "Forget it. I've seen you before, insulin. I've got enough energy. No thanks." kick that into storage um, because we've uh, are we're constantly bombarding it's kind of like the the like door-to-door -door salesman like you just don't want to hear you know the we don't get as many of those anymore maybe maybe that the person on the phone that keeps calling you and says hey are you sure you want this are you sure you don't want this and you're like no i have it already i'm good i don't want it anymore right that's kind of what insulin becomes to the body when we are constantly um, eating sugar, or we're constantly letting our, our sugar levels be elevated by not giving our body a break in between meals. So when we do give our body a chance to clear glucose out of the, the system, uh, out of the bloodstream, our body still needs energy. And so what it will do is it goes to the liver and it says, hey, liver, guess what? We're out of glucose. We need some energy. And so the glucose breaks down fatty acid chains, long-term long -term fat. If it can't get it directly from the liver, it'll go to the rest of your cells in your body that are storing fat. And it will say, hey, guess what? We need energy. Let's release those fatty acid chains. Bring them to me in the liver. I'm going to break them down into a ketone. So a ketone is a type of energy that we can use when we don't have glucose in our bloodstream. Um, it will happen when we break down those fatty acids, those, those fats that are being stored in your body. So when you do get into more of a ketosis state, meaning your body's releasing ketones rather than glucose, 
then you'll feel that sustained energy. It'll be more constant. It's a much more efficient energy than using uh, glucose. So this is one of the benefits that we get of fasting, okay? Let's talk about the different types of fasting. So there are uh, several different types. I'm gonna just really hone in on really two types. So there's a time-restricted eating type and there are circadian rhythm, which is your 12 to 12, which means 12 hours of fasting, 12 hours of eating time period. You don't eat that whole time, but you eat within that 12 hours, right? You can also break those down into 14, 10 or 16, eight, meaning 14 hours that you're fasting, 10 that you're eating or 16 fasting, eight that you're eating, okay? Um, I do not recommend anyone goes more than uh, eight or, or less than eight hours uh, of eating time frame, or differently said, longer than 16 hours of uh, fasting time. I just wouldn't recommend it. It's kind of hard on your body once you get to that point. Um, definitely, I would recommend starting with the 12-12, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. You will hear about other types of fasting, ones that I do not recommend. Periodic fasting, that's like you do a week on, a week off. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, it really confuses your body. Uh, it's not a, a way to actually get uh, the type of results long-term that you want. Because um, what you're doing is you'll, you'll, your body will think it's starving one week. And then the next week, it'll say, oh, I, I got to get all this food in me. I got to save this food. I, I just wouldn't recommend that type. Um, alternate day fasting, what I see as an issue with this one is that's one day on, one day off, or two days on, two days off. You can't get into a rhythm where you actually keep it. Um, that's, the, that's the main difference that I see with alternate day fasting is people just don't create the habit. They'll do two days on and then they'll be like, eh, well, I'll just skip this day and then I'll make it up. You just don't get back in the habit. So I recommend doing the circadian rhythm 1212 is a great way to start. And we're going to talk about that. And then you can move into a 1410 if you'd like. Okay. So here are the do's of fasting. Um, you eat, start out eating from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., right? I wouldn't recommend eating past 7 p.m. specifically because you want to give yourself three hours before you go to sleep. Um, uh, so if you guys go to sleep usually around 10 right. or so, then we've got that three-hour window. All right. Austin's laughing because he didn't... Oh, Austin's sneezing. I thought you were laughing because you don't go to bed till two in the morning. So you're like... <laughs> <laughs> even, even if you don't go to bed till late, 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 I would still recommend that you don't eat um, after 7 p.m. Uh, the reason why is, again, we showed you this in last week's lesson. If you eat that late, what happens is your blood sugar is going to spike high and then it's going to not even get down to the 70 range again until late, late, late in the morning um, when you're first about to eat again. Um, you don't want that. You ideally like to have that blood sugar level decrease significantly before you go to sleep. You'll actually sleep better too. So for all of us. Yes. Not just one of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And then please, uh, here's another suggestion. Keep your eating window to one hour. So for instance, eat from seven to eight, but don't eat eight to whenever your next eating window is, right? So my, mine at, uh, I start eating at um, eight um, or 8.30, but I'm around eight. And I don't eat again until 1230. Okay. So just keep it to an hour. Uh, whenever you're going to eat, keep it to an hour. And then if you do get hungry in between, I do get hungry in between. And I actually use the oil that crystal in addition to helping out with weight, uh, uh, like releasing fat from cells. Um, that one can also help with satiation. And that's what I use it for because I get hungry in between meals and, um, I don't, I've eaten plenty, but my body is just like, sometimes it gets hungry. I'm like, okay, I'll just use some of these to help out. So that's a little way to be able to help you out is to use that MetaPower oil. <clears throat> Here are the don'ts. We already said this, don't eat within three hours of going to bed. This guy's getting his late night snack in this picture. Um, don't snack throughout the day. 
if you do need to snack in the day, go ahead. Maybe early on, you might feel like, oh, I need to snack. Just eat nuts. Whatever nuts you want to use, just eat nuts or, seeds. or nut butters or seeds. Yeah, use that. It's high in fat. It's a lot more high in protein. It's going to be a slow release. It's not going to kick you out of a, a ketosis state as much. So I would definitely suggest that you, um, if you do need to snack, snack on nuts because that will give you long sustained energy. And then I do not recommend that people start out fasting longer than 14 hours. Okay. So uh, if you're going to move to the 16 hours, don't do that right away. You can start at 14, but just don't, don't go into that quick. Okay. So how would one transition into um, fasting, intermittent fasting? Here is kind of, you can take a screenshot of this or it, they are in the notes too, if you downloaded the notes. Um, but this is what I recommend for the first month, just do, um, if you think it's going to be hard for you, uh, for myself, I just did straight, I went seven to seven, um, Monday through Saturday, right? That's how I started. If you think it's going to be a little bit harder for you, then work into it. So do Monday through Friday, 77. And then Saturday and Sunday, you can eat normally. Sometimes if you're at church, that can be difficult too, because you'll, you know, you'll have meetings or whatever. And um, you, your eating schedule might get thrown off a little bit, or you're doing errands all day on Saturday, and you haven't quite figured out how to work this into your system. Just giving yourself a little bit of uh, leniency for Saturday, Sunday can be helpful. Okay. Um, month two, shave off an hour in the morning. Don't still eat after seven. Uh, and then eat normally Saturday, Sunday. Month three, you're going to shave off this Saturday, Sunday. And then month four, you can work down to uh, another hour, nine to seven. Um, so I would suggest this gradually going down um, so your body can kind of ease into it and you're still sticking to a system, but you're just not going crazy. Okay. So that would be how it would kind of look. Now, there are certain possibilities. Um, this is, you know, everyone's favorite Disney character, Grumpy. You might feel a little bit hangry starting out. Um, that is definitely a possibility. If you do, that's probably going to be within the first two to four weeks. Okay. Um, personally, I did not experience this when I started um, intermittent fasting, but you can get the hunger pains. Um, I don't know, uh, Masons, did you guys feel uh, the hunger pains? When, I know you guys have done intermittent fasting for a while. Uh, do you guys do you guys remember feeling those or? For sure. Well, so that's a funny thing that you mentioned the hunger pinks, because for me, intermittent fasting was about me learning um, what actual hunger felt like instead of like emotional hunger yeah, or hunger from boredom. So I actually waited for the hunger pains to eat so that I could know, am I actually hungry or do I just think I'm hungry? Oh, that's great. That's a really good hint. I've never heard of that. That's a really great hint. So mindful eating. Yeah. Did you have to, how long did it take you to figure that out? I mean, like to like really hone in on that to be like, okay. Um, probably, yeah, I would say three weeks, three weeks. The first three weeks when we started this were the hardest because of breaking from sugar and learning what hunger felt like, like real hunger felt like. But after three weeks, then it was habit. And also once I cut out the sugar and added the healthy fats, like you said, being satiated, I found that I ate a lot less in general. It's really interesting because fats fill you up, right? Where sugars don't fill you up, but fats will actually fill you up. Slow release. Awesome. Thanks for the insight. Does Has anyone else uh, tried intermittent fasting or would like to add their ideas, uh, things that have worked for them, or even questions that they have about um, what we've gone over so far. That was a long question I just asked. Anything intermittent fasting related? <laughs> right, anything. Um, I know it helps with your gut. Like I just had, um, I have some gut issues. I've always had IBS. <laughs> And I started intermittent fasting about three weeks ago, and I am noticing 
a change in in my bloating when whenever I um, stick to it. It's a little bit harder on the weekends um, okay. because weekends are not as structured as the weeks. But um, yeah, it's slow and steady. I've been doing it for yeah for a few weeks now, and I have noticed my IBS flare ups are less. And awesome. that's really why I got into it was because of my, um, I read somewhere that it helps with your, with, if you have problems with digestion, I don't know if you guys, I, I you didn't touch on that, but do you have any thoughts on that on your, that's, on like digestion? Absolutely. So what it will help and what you're experiencing likely Claudia is the, um, because you aren't giving your body as much sugar, um, so your, your bacteria in your digestive system, it feeds off glucose as its first thing that it likes. The bacteria in your digestive system is not necessarily a problem. You actually want bacteria. You just don't want over proliferation. You don't want too much bacteria in your, in your gut. And so what happens is when we eat too much sugar um, or we don't have sugar that breaks down slowly, then what, act, what ends up happening is we get uh, that over proliferation. And when that happens, we end up getting um, a bloating, we end up getting irritation in the digestive system. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna let Crystal answer Sabrina's yeah. question because I have to plug in my phone here. Give me oh, just okay. a so Sabrina, your question is really wonderful. Can snacks be fruits instead of nuts? So yes, it can. Um, as we were saying last week, we definitely want to bring fruits. Um, and something that I would actually do, what would be best is pairing the two. So having like a fruit with um, as we were talking about really and I dealt with digestive issues too um if we have any issues with like breaking down nuts and like we could possibly even deal with constipation then um can you guys hear us okay um so seeds are going to be better than nuts being able to break it down. So I would do something like sun butter with like an apple. So cutting up the apple slices and then putting sun butter on it, um, that would be a good option or even having like a handful of nuts and seeds with the fruit. So does that help answer your question, Sabrina? Absolutely. Thank you so much because I'm a, a fruit lover. That's why I'm always asking about fruits. I love fruits and, uh, you know, I always hear you say nuts and, uh, you know, I'm, I cannot leave the fruits out. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I can't either. I have to have like them paired. I don't know. <laughs> and, and what we'll do, Sabrina, what I would suggest, I love fruits too. Um, I would suggest trying to eat fruits with your meals. So pair, like, oh, okay. Pick you back in on the end of your meal. Make like, it a dessert. Make it a dessert. Yep. Because if you do that, you're you're eating them all together in your your time frame, your hour time frame. I'd recommend doing that. The nuts would just be a suggestion if you're eating in between, at, like if you're eating like at three o'clock and you get your bowl and you're like, I need something. That would be a time to eat nuts rather than sugar because you don't want to spike your sugar up really high again. Okay. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. We don't want you to cut out fruits. We don't want you to cut out vegetables. You need them. Definitely need them. We, I know this has been fat heavy today. We have more lessons on vegetables and fruits coming up too. And I actually, I'll show you at the end of this lesson, I, I'll show you what a day of me intermittent fasting looks like so that you can see where I eat fruits and vegetables and, and my fats. Okay. We want to honor your time. So keep going through and then if yeah. You, again, if you have questions, keep keep them keep, coming. Keep them coming. All right. So, um, really quickly, I want to make sure fasting is not for everyone. So, who shouldn't fast? Children do not need to fast. Um, you can put them on a twelve twelve uh, circadian rhythm uh, diet, but don't don't 
don't do more than that. Don't make them fast longer than that. Um, it's not going to be beneficial to children. They don't need to, to lose. Well, I should say most children don't need to, to lose weight. So I would say, but putting them on a 1212 would actually put them in a, a place where they could lose weight if they did need to lose weight. Okay. Pregnant and nursing mothers, um, babies need glucose and ketones. And so I, I just, uh, I just wouldn't put them in this type of diet. Okay. And then people with eating disorders, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, you wouldn't want to, they're going to go into more extreme ways of fasting. If they want to stick on a 12, 12. Okay. If you want to have a, a, a nursing mother, pregnant mother sticking on a 12, 12, or even maybe even less than, um, than 12 hours or more than 12 hours. Uh, let, let's see, fasting for less than 12 hours would be fine too. Okay. Um, and then people who generally shouldn't fast, um, it depends on the person, but people over the age of 70, uh, as a general rule of thumb, they're going to, their body's going to be burning through calories a lot of times to try and um, keep them alive. That's why people will start losing weight uh, in their later years. So no more than a 12-12 for them. And then people with chronic diseases should not do more than a 12-12, okay? All right, usually you're going to start losing weight uh, with uh, about four weeks. It'll be about four weeks before you start to lose it. And you'll start to lose about one to two pounds a week. That's pretty typical, right? If you're losing like five, five, six, seven pounds, that's a little bit crazy and you're probably dehydrated. So I wouldn't, yeah. Go back just, to lesson one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go back to lesson one and go drink some more water. <laughs> um, here's a typical day of what I do. So um, morning buck, buckwheat with coconut oil. So buckwheat is a carbohydrate, but it also has protein. It has actually a high amount of protein for, uh, for a, it's not a wheat, it's a pseudo grain, right? But it's kind of like oatmeal. Yeah. Like the way you would prepare it is like an oatmeal. Yep. Yep. We're actually going to have a lesson. Uh, our, one of our, our cooking classes we're going to shoot out to you is, um, this week is going to be about buckwheat for breakfast. So this is where I incorporate fats. I do coconut oil. I do coconut shreds. I do sunflower seeds inside my buckwheat, okay? Because it's a complex carbohydrate, it's gonna have a slow release. It is higher in, um, like I said, carbs, but it, it's much, I, I should say, it's lower on the glycemic index because it's a complex carb, okay? Eggs with shredded cheese, that's where I'm getting, I'm getting both of those are fat, right? Um, and protein. And then also I do uh, a handful of berries. So I'm getting my uh, fruits in there. I'll also, a lot of times I'll have like something like half a banana in there. Didn't put that in here. Spelt toast with butter. So I'm doing a non-grain toast and there's my fats again with the butter. And then I do a no omega oil supplement along with other supplements, but specific to this class, I want to show you what I do with that. And then I do MetaPower oil in the morning um, to help with my metabolism. Okay. 1230. So I don't eat again until 1230. I'll oftentimes have something like a quinoa and salad base. Uh, I'll do quinoa, quinoa with salad base and then veggies, chicken, and avocado. So I'm getting my fats from the avocado and chicken. Um, and then I'll do apple slices with sunflower butter, uh, or sunflower, sun, uh, sun nut butter. Um, so sunflower seed, yep. And, uh, and then I'll use the hummus. So again, I'm getting my fats from hummus and from the sunflower, right? And then uh, I use some MetaPower oil at three o'clock because I get hungry. 6.30 p.m., I do chicken stir fry with avocado. We do olive oil. We cook it in olive oil. So that, uh, is again, where I'm getting fats along with the avocado and the chicken salad and balsamic dressing that's where i'm getting more fats and then um, i do eat some fruit for dessert usually so that kind of it gives you an idea of what a typical day of intermittent fasting could look like where you're getting enough of your fats in and how i'm getting them in so i'm using avocado oil butters cheeses 
eggs, olives. All I will do. We, I didn't put olives in there, but yeah, we we eat a lot of olives, um, avocado, chicken. So does that kind of give you guys an idea? We're not we're not limiting what we're eating as far as you know fruits and vegetables, um, and we're still getting in all our fats. Cool. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, cool. Um, any questions before we do our goal, any questions, uh, about intermittent fasting concerns, uh, you know, is it, it does it make sense? Any confusion on it? Okay. Um, so goals this week, were you going to say something? Okay. Commit not to eat after 7 p.m. every night. Joel, one second. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. um, I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, how many hours do you do? Um, so, more than 15 hours or 16 hours? No, I don't ever do more than 16. I, I, I'm right now, I'm at more I'm between 13. Uh, I'm at like uh, 13, between 13 and 14. I'm right in that range. Okay. But I don't actually think I'll get down to 16 personally. I think I'm probably going to stay between 12 and 14. So and uh, it just depends on, for me, I've actually reached my ideal weight. I, I, had, I came down seven pounds and right now I'm at my, my preferred weight, which is 165. And that was when he started doing more with the MetaPower yep. first and then the intermittent fasting Correct. over the past couple months here. Right. It, to because I came yeah when I used MetaPower I came I shrunk uh two and a half inches around my waist but I didn't lose any weight and then pounds pounds I should say yeah and then intermittent fasting I came down seven pounds and so that combined with the other got me to my ideal weight and size so okay so then, uh, thank you Okay, cool. So our goal this week is not to eat after 7 p.m. every night. So that may be tricky, but just maybe put an alarm on your phone and just say, okay, can't eat past seven. I see Amy shaking her head. I, I know that it can be tough sometimes. I think, I think like I'm my biggest, this week. yeah, like my biggest <laughs> problem is that meals for me with six kids means I'm like three meals a day with six kids, you know, I'm like busy going and so, Maybe that will be part yeah. of my goal is to like actually it's it's difficult probably even more with the younger kids to just sit down and eat myself without and feeling like i'm enjoying the experience and you're really getting a full amount of food and you're aware of what you're eating so when they're all you know i'm like snacking while i'm cooking and then i'm helping them and whatever and so by the time they all go to bed it's like oh i mean like, eat. you you like you miss that time like even emotionally to like sit down and just take care of yourself, you know, feed yourself. So, and I, I mean, I don't make terribly poor choices after bedtime or something. I, or after seven, I just know that it's probably better if I take the time, take the moments during the day to really feed yourself and care for yourself. So and I know it's always a struggle and I don't have six kids. So I don't, I, you, you've met Finn, we've got one, but I, so I don't even, I can't even, it, I, applaud you it's amazing uh what you're what you're you know doing and what you're up against <laughs> but um but maybe having a time frame that does work for you yeah so like eight o'clock might be a better time or even nine you know like and especially if you're sleeping closer like to 11 or something then yeah that the eight o'clock would still work within that three hour time yeah. frame you still want to keep it you want to yeah you want to have your three hours before you go to sleep. That's that's the ideal. That's why we shoot shoot for seven. But it, if you need to do eight because you go to bed late, um, and if you have if the kids are up and down, you might not get. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think another part is like spikes in exercise for us. Like the time that I feel like I can focus on myself and exercise, and then you your body's. You said last week. You said eat your biggest meal when you have the highest activity. You know. Yeah. And so, and that's the time I exercise. Like I'll go for a hard walk or I'll do yoga walk, yeah. or something like later after the kids go to sleep. And then you're like yeah. so hungry and yes. you know, it's still, 
you need I know you need good sleep and early to bed early to rise it's hard it's hard it is hard fitting in all the pieces but I think that's another reason eating later works for us because that's when we exercise and this makes sense like you that's you perfect. have to make it work for you because if you work out after you eat dinner you're you you can eat a larger meal for dinner because you want to do it you want to make sure you have the fuel to actually fuel yourself through your exercise so that's not a bad plan so cool. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the real talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good question there. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask before we hop off? You're more than welcome to email us or, uh, or, you know, give us a call or, or we're happy to answer questions that way too. Um, if not, we're going to go ahead and give you a cliffhanger for next week. Proteins is what we're talking about. It ain't all meat. We're going to talk about, we are going to talk about meats, but we're going to talk about lots of different options that you can have uh, for your proteins, um, which should be fun. Some might surprise you and some might not, but it'll be, yeah, a lot of fun to, uh, to go through that. Um, until then, fast well, friends. We'll send out your, uh, your videos midweek and hopefully you like our buckwheat recipe. Uh, but until then, yeah, we hope everything goes well. Awesome. Great to see you all. Have a wonderful night. Good luck. Good luck with the fasting and the facts. Thank Take you. Thank you guys. Have a great Bye, night. Guys. Everybody.